Greetings from the European Parliament studio in Brussels. My name is Ilze Nagla and today we will be talking about cybersecurity and disinformation. How ready we are to fight back. And today I'm joined by Sandra Kalniete, member of European Parliament from Latvia, from the political group of European People's Party. Nice to have you here. And from the Netherlands, I'm joined by Bart Grotius, who is from the political group of Renew Europe. Um, I have a feeling that cyberspace these days uh, is actually more unsafe and there are more threats than in the real world. And also more manipulations and crimes. At least we talk about it, it seems to be m talking about it more. You have prepared a report on foreign interference, including this information. So how those manipulations are taking uh, place? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the digital world is our real world because we are acting, reading, even living in it. And that is important. And if, um, if I would say uh, how to uh, find the, right, the, the challenge what we are having in our committee is how to make recommendations which find the right balance between our freedoms and challenges, how to uh, regulate, uh, legislate and enforce uh, rules, what we need to make uh, digital space, which is really like a, a, an iceberg, that part which is under the water, uh, that it is functional, that rule of law um, uh, is functional there, and that is really a huge challenge. And do we see a lot of manipulations there? Oh, yes. I think everything about digital space in social media, except maybe very private dimension, is about manipulations. How do you see? I mean, you have been working in cybersecurity uh, area, so cyber threats are real. Yes, they are. And how prepared are we to fight them? Well, listen, in, in 2019, in my home country, the Netherlands, cybercrime doubled. In 2020, the Federal Bureau of, Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, came out that ransomware worldwide tripled. And now, in 2021, we see another peak. All security agencies tell me there's a new peak. It's also a pandemic, but in ransomware. We see new things. In, in the disinformation sphere, it's the same. After the COVID pandemic, in the COVID pandemic, it became it became quite apparent that both China and Russia are stepping up their game into the disinformation game. So what we try to do here in Parliament is counter it. And if we are trying to do so, it means that we don't have everything in place yet. So to answer your question, we should be doing a better job, and we can. We have good instruments to do so. And we are far better positioned than ever to do so because it is also a way of communicating new norms, new legislation in a civilian domain and not always in the military domain. Many new militaries attack us through our civilian channels and the European Union often has better cards to deal with that than, for example, NATO. So we could be complementary to the NATO to be better secured against such threats. But uh, I just may I, I, yes. I uh, add something because uh, uh, Bart is very optimistic. I'm less optimistic because uh, the speed, uh, the the pace of the development of emerging and disrupting technologies are such that we legislators, it's inevitable that we are uh, all the time trying to catch them and always we are too late and knowing that our family uh, has institutions and then member states and each member state understands slightly differently the threats etc etc, it eats the time. And this is something what we really are lacking, and particularly with each next year. But it's also probably the IT companies and, and sort of the digital players themselves, they are not so eager for you to regulate them. But why they should? <laughs> there are no enforcement, there are some voluntary declarations they accepted, and they use a different sort of malicious content as a basis for their uh, revenues and income and etc and development and one of our tasks is 
not only on the level of the union, because in the union at least we already have some regulations and we are um, developing the, the uh, new ones, but how we can interact globally, because it's not a local problem, that even not continental, it's a global problem. And the, when we look to the state uh, uh, of legislation, which is non-existing in the United States yeah. regarding data protection, uh, harvesting, uh, storage, and, uh, and uh, also uh, selling, then we see that we are practically uh, handicapped. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned China and, and Russia, and we know that China's uh, cyber uh, offensive uh, capabilities are growing. So uh, how ready European countries are to fight back and do we have our own army of the hackers? Ah, well, first of all, I think that the Chinese actually learned from the Russians how to do this game. With MH17, many of my countrymen have died there. There, was a, there were many disinformation campaigns and the Chinese tried to copy that in a very aggressive form during the COVID pandemic. And I think that they learned. That's why we are stepping up our game to counter that. I personally amended uh, the budget to create a China team at the European External Action Service to make sure that we analyze it and that we can also make sure that we do something against it. Now on the cyber field, their hacking capabilities have grown, their intellectual property theft has grown and that is extremely worrying. And I think their potential for sabotage of essential and vital infrastructures has grown as well. If we've seen in India and a couple of countries in the, in the eastern part of this world. Well, I think that what we should do, m m many of the things that we do against, that's, let's say, the, the hacking of, of China is an intelligence competence. So those are the intelligence agencies fighting it. But we can also do much more from ourselves, from our own sphere, in our own jurisdiction, to heighten our posture, to do more on cybersecurity measures and make sure that we protect our companies better. And we are working on that legislation very hard and I'm very eager to get that through Parliament as soon as we can. I'm still going to push you on this uh, army of hackers yeah. uh, uh, more. Uh, we have the regular armies, right? Uh, to, to counter the military, military threat yeah. that are able to and, and willing to fight back. In the digital world, we, we talked about the sort of how we, we can protect ourselves, yeah. but what about the counter attack? Well, I think it's mainly an intelligence competition uh, and also an intelligence competence to counter that. It's also a competence by the military, but as we've seen recently, we've seen a Russian ransomware gang being disrupted by a Western nation, and that is very interesting to see. To see that because ransomware, for example, is not... Americans went after them, right? Yeah, probably, but the, the, the ransomware is not just a criminal offense. It's not just a cybersecurity. It's also an instrument of Russian foreign politics. We should also be looking at it from that perspective, to engage with them di diplomatically, to sanction it, because this is not going away if we don't get to the source. Many of these ransomware gangs, they don't attack Russians. If you look at the malware, the technical feasibilities of the software they use, it is not going live. It will not hack a system like the Colonial Pipeline system in America. It, it would not have gone live. It would not have hacked the Americans if there was a Russian keyboard attached or Russian settings on that computer were there. And that, that is actually coded into the software that, that, that these hackers use. So they are not criminals. It's also an instrument of foreign policy by the Russian state and we should address it accordingly. But also on the political level, uh, when we, for instance, talk about the disinformation as well, how ready and willing we are to, to fight back rather than just protect ourselves, educate ourselves? Should we be more aggressive Wait, maybe in that sense? Um, what I would say that uh, the will to, uh, to counteract it is present and it is growing with every new complication we are having. But intelligence is not enough and uh, legislation is not enough. What we also have to raise is awareness about the threat and danger, which in general among Europeans is rather low, but what is even uh, more, uh, more uh, difficult that among uh, decision makers and policy makers, it is also low. And one of the tasks is to raise that awareness and also the practical skills, how to deal with disruptive uh, 
interventions. And, and this is something what we still have to, to learn on a very horizontal and general uh, yeah. level. Otherwise, we will lose that. But happily, not in Russia, neither uh, elsewhere, these skills are high. That's why we can be rather proud. And when we look to, to European Union, uh, what would be very uh, 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 difficult situation if every member state would adopt its own set of regulations and legislation. And happily now, when we are having this agreement, which is on the table, but not uh, really 100% de detailed between United States and European Union, uh, those countries, four or five, uh, who are having already the national legislation, they accept to withdraw it and to work on a general uh, legislation. And I think it is very important and that will be the test of a real political will of our member states. Yeah. But we can test the political will also in another manner. For example, by collectively addressing the threat. We are not doing that as well. No. So, for example, intellectual property theft or disinformation or economic coercion. We are in the European Union together and what we should do is collectively address such threats. What we do now is often inaction, do nothing. And that only encourages Beijing and Moscow with low cost, low risk, high reward calculus. It's only being fostered. What we should do is actually collectively with all 27 and others in the world address that threat. Mm. Also, the European Union has quite good cards in hand to, to address such threats. Also because it's below the threshold of a military attack, we should also respond below the threshold of a military attack, and we are good positioned. So I agree with Ms. Garnieta, we should do it collectively. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, there is another aspect in the whole cyber, cyber security uh, area, that's uh, our data is, is being collected in large amounts, it's being traded, uh, and that also makes us more vulnerable, right? And what can we do about that? I would say that data currently is the basis of everything that uh, lack of regulation on data market. Yes, we have adopted uh, regulations on privacy and so on, but what we do not have, any transparency from platforms. Practically, we, we are not able really to assess how do they follow these rules. But as I said before, in the Union, we are in a much better situation. But regarding data, um, I think that there are uh, several key words. The first one is accountability. They have to account for what they are har uh, harvesting, what they are storing, and how long they are storing. And I'm speaking about it in my report. And secondly, it's transparency. We, we must know how their at least uh, for for researchers and media and NGO who are uh, specializing in, in in these subjects, they have to have access to their um, uh, algorithms and and understand. And then there is some also areas which are very much linked to. Uh, privacy of each or the other. Whenever you open Guardian or Internet Shop or whatever, you s that jumps up. Uh, do you agree? Do you yeah. agree? Yes. And if you do not agree, then please read these twelve pages in a very small mm. uh, shrift. Uh, and choose what you will not agree. And this also has to be uh, brought to a, a human. Uh, uh, comprehension level, that it is uh, uh, for us clear to what we agree and not. And, and if you do not agree, then you are blocked, you can, can't go Sometimes farther. you can't even yeah. read the content if and, you don't agree. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the uh, things which is very close to my, uh, my heart is how to deal with the harmful intent and harmful content. Because uh, it's not a legal it's very difficult to define legally. But the consequences, like we have seen with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and also with um, uh, attack to capital uh, building, are, they are real. They are uh, legally 
definable. And uh, this is something where we are uh, like on the land, which is absolutely shaky and unclear, but the conse consequences are huge. I, I very much appreciate that our commission wants to set up this disinformation observation laboratories, but there also have to be uh, not only technical criteria when you are choosing those NGOs who will observe this information. Because, for instance, from Baltic states and also from many other mm. uh, most geopolitically exposed countries to disinformation, not a single NGO received that grant. And it's not correct. And uh, we, Baltic MEPS, we wrote a letter to Commissioner Vestager asking to receive us and to discuss it. From the Netherlands, I agree, Sandra. <laughs> but when we talk about this data collection, and uh, I notice that you are, you are present in some social media on Twitter, you're not present, for instance, on Facebook. No. Um, I'm just wondering, knowing what you know about cybersecurity, about the data that is collected about you on sort of the digital world, uh, what are those things that you d do differently from the rest of us? Uh, that's an interesting question because there's no such thing as 100% security. The only thing that you can do is really raise the bar for an attacker to come in. I think it was about four or five hours after I was appointed as rapporteur in the new cybersecurity legislation here in the parliament, I received my first spear phishing email, very well crafted. And I, I was glad to recognize that. So that was good. And I gave it to the security services to analyze it, but of course. But for the rest, I live like any normal citizen. And I try to be very vigilant and aware of what is going on in the digital domain. And I, I, I use everything to my disposal to protect myself. But it's not like I'm, I, I'm, I'm fully protected because, yeah, there's always an opportunity for a hacker to come in. But you have to be aware. You have to be vigilant. I campaigned without social media because I was working at the Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to use social media there. But it was very good to see I had a preferential vote because, uh, 21,000 votes, because the cybersecurity community, the disinformation community, these people, they knew me. They knew where, where, where they could vote. And they, uh, it's, it's possible to still uh, campaign without social media. But it's getting harder. And I know that the real world, like Sandra said, is also online. But uh, have you had any slip-ups that uh, you have uh, sort of accepted something that uh, sort of shouldn't be accepted in, in, in terms of like strange emails, spams or stuff like that? I, I get that every once in a while, yeah, sure. And I'm being targeted like many here in the European institutions. And one of the things that I'd really like to stress is that if we ask stuff from our businesses and our institutions to heighten their security posture, to be more vigilant, I think that we should lead by example. And for example, the European Parliament should do much much more than we are doing now. The European Commission and Council as well. We should lead by example. The ministries, also in Latvia and the Dutch, we should set an example on how to lead and becoming more secure. Thank you so much for this discussion. We talked about the digital world, how it uh, can be safer, what we need to, uh, to do, and how that can be done on the EU level. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.